Hello and welcome to um, this year's course or the course that I'm doing um, in part three introduction to additive combinatorics. Um, I'm sorry that uh, I'm not going to be lecturing in person. My own judgment of my own sort of risk tolerance I think with, with uh, COVID is a bit smaller than some people's and I feel that with an extremely prevalent virus and one that is very very infectious um, the chances of catching it myself and indeed the chances of one of you spreading it to somebody else are just a bit higher than I'm comfortable with um, I realize that that has some disadvantages and that there'll be much less interaction while I'm when I'm well be no interaction when I'm actually giving a lecture um, I hope there will be the opportunity for some sort of interaction. So I would just say before anything else that um, you should really feel free to uh, get in touch with me if you have mathematical questions and that sort of thing, just dropping me a, an email. Um, and if it's if it really becomes quite complicated, then we could even set up a, a Zoom meeting or something like that to, to discuss it. Um, one or two other things that may slightly compensate for um, the lack of direct interaction during lectures is that uh, I'm going to do what I did last year when I also lectured um, online, which is to write a rather full set of printed notes as I go along. So normally when I lecture in person, I don't do that. I just write on the blackboard and everybody copies things down. But I feel that uh, copying down from a, a recorded lecture just makes, I mean, on on a computer, that makes no sense at all, unless you want to do it. Um, so instead, I shall be providing printed notes. I'll aim to get those. I haven't done it for this first lecture, but I'll in general, I'll aim to have the printed notes uh, ready somewhat before the lecture. And that'll give you the, or before the, the video goes online, and that will... Um, give you the opportunity if you want to to read the notes before the lecture or before watching the video or you can watch the video and then read the notes and uh, I, I just leave it to you to decide what works best for you in that respect but it gives you more sort of options I think. Um, it also gives me an opportunity actually which is that um, because the notes will contain complete proofs with complete detail um, it frees me up a little bit in the videos to um, be slightly less formal. I, I don't mean that I won't, you know, I'll be sloppy or I won't give proper arguments, but I just mean that sometimes there will be details like uh, there is some constant C where in the notes I might actually show that it works when C equals five or something like that. And in, in the lectures, I just won't, I will try uh, not to take quite so much care over those details and instead concentrate a bit more on what's actually interesting about um, the ideas and that kind of thing. Um, so let me move quickly on to an obvious question, which is what is um, additive combinatorics? And before I get on to that, I think I want to share my screen. Um, so that I can write a few things down. So additive combinatorics is in a way a subject that uh, grew out of an earlier subject, uh, which is called combinatorial number theory. And as its name suggests, um, combinatorial number theory is some sort of mixture of uh, combinatorics and um, number theory. And I suppose one could say, what is combinatorics? You could say it's the study of <clears throat> objects, mathematical objects that don't have very much uh, structure. They have, they're, they're sort of, they have rather loose constraints. So to give an example, a graph what have you got? You've just got a set, a set of vertices, and just an arbitrary subset of the pairs of the set. So you could say, what is a graph? A graph is an arbitrary subset of a complete graph. Let's say it's a finite graph, so it's got n vertices. A graph is an arbitrary subset of the complete graph on n vertices. And so 
an arbitrary subset of an arbitrary set is not a, a, a terribly interesting thing to study because there's no if you, all you know is that it's a subset of some set you haven't been told anything that distinguishes the uh, elements of that set but the elements of uh, of the complete graph on n vertices are edges so the complete graph itself kn has some structure and so graph theory, this is I'm speaking slightly sort of uh, philosophically and abstractly, you could say graph theory is interesting because although you're taking just an arbitrary subset of Kn uh, on which you can, make, you can make some hypotheses about it, of course, uh, the structure of Kn has some significant effect on, on that um, subset. It gives it the structure we know, the sort of graph structure. And uh, other combinatorial objects that one studies like hypergraphs or the discrete cube or subsets of the discrete cube are, are similar in that sort of way that you, you take some quite nice structure and you pass down to an arbitrary subset of that and combinatorial number theory is a bit like that but uh, the big set of which you look at arbitrary subsets is typically not always but typically the set of integers or maybe the set of positive integers and sometimes a set of real numbers or rational numbers and so on so a typical problem in combinatorial number theory will be about a set of integers, but it will not be about some specific set of integers like the set of primes or the set of cubes or something like that, uh, about which there are several very interesting problems. But those would count as more purely number theoretic problems because the sets are specific and have a lot of structure. Uh, instead, um, we look at just as again, arbitrary subsets of integers. And what makes the subject combinatorics is that the arbitrariness of these sets, the fact that we don't, we, we typically make very loose assumptions on the sets. But what makes it number theory is that, of course, they are subsets of Z, and the elements of Z are numbers, and more to the point, uh, they're objects on which you have arithmetic operations like plus and times. Actually, I should say at this point, if you're if one's talking about problems that uh, only involve plus, then we can say additive combinatorics. Some problems involve plus and times. I'll mention one in just a moment. And then we say arithmetic combinatorics. <clears throat> um, but uh, I won't really be talking about um, multiplicative problems or problems that mix addition and multiplication, except just mentioning one at the very beginning. Um, so I think just to say a little more about combinatorial number theory, I think I'm going to give you some examples of some open problems. And I find them very, very nice open problems. So the first one I want to talk about is called the Erdős, I think it's called this, the Erdős basis problem. So we say a basis um, of order two, you can talk about uh, um, other higher order basis, but I won't talk about that today. So a basis of order two of the natural numbers, uh, perhaps I'll add zero just to be, uh, it'll be slightly more convenient, is a subset uh, x of the set, such that uh, for all n in n, union zero, there exist x and y in x such that um, x plus y equals n. And um, Erdős's question was, uh, if x is a basis and k is a natural number, Uh, must there exist some such that uh, some natural number n such that n equals x plus y with x and y in x? So far, so good. Obviously, yes. But the question is in at least k different ways. So if the answer is no, it would say something like you can find some set x 
such that every number can be represented in at least one way as a sum of elements of x, but no number can be expressed in, say, more than a hundred ways or something like that. And uh, we do not know whether such sets exist. Let's uh, have a look at... Um, so there's actually a very closely related question. So if x is a basis, then because um, the number of... Uh, I'm going to introduce a little bit of notation here, actually. So let A be a set, a, a finite set, then uh, we say that A plus A is the set of x plus y such that x and y belong to A. So a trivial upper bound for the size of A plus A is just the total number of pairs x, y, so n squared. And in fact, we can do slightly better than that because x plus y equals y plus x. So actually we get uh, n plus 1 choose 2 if you work it out. So you get n choose 2 plus the um, x plus x things, which gives you n plus 1 choose 2. And from that we get that if x is a basis, then uh, the size of x intersect 1 up to n must be at least, well, big enough for the size of this set plus 1 choose 2 to be at least as big as n, because you can't make n out of uh, two things if one of them is bigger than n. So uh, let's just be a little bit sloppy about this and just say it's got to be at least the square root of n. Um, <clears throat> we could do slightly better than that, more like square root of n over 2 or something. Uh, anyway, or maybe I'm sorry, I mean the square root of 2n probably. Uh, but um, so we can ask a slightly weaker question. Uh, if y is such that y intersect 1 to n is greater than or equal to square root of n, and I think we can even put in a little constant c there, but I, I won't bother to do that, uh, must there exist? Uh, so that's uh, for all n. So must there exist m such that uh, m equals y plus z, y and z in y uh, in at least k ways, where k is some arbitrary integer. Uh, because this is my first lecture, I can't quite remember how the technology works, but I fortunately have remembered, so I've managed to get myself another page. Um, so here, basically, the point I want to make is that uh, we've got a much weaker hypothesis on the set. Um, a set can have this second property, that it intersects every 1 up to n in at least square root of n elements without being anything close to a basis. Um, I should also mention that you can talk about a set being a multiplicative basis. That would say that every element of every natural number can be written as a product in at least one way. And then actually there's a rather nice and not too difficult proof that there must be um, some number that can be written as a product in at least k ways, whatever k was that you started with. So the, the same question for products uh, has a known answer, and the answer is uh, Yes, there must be some M that can be written as a product in at least K ways. So that's one very nice open problem. Uh, here comes another one that's somewhat uh, similar in flavour because it also involves writing things as sums in more than one way and that kind of thing. But it's, it goes in slightly the opposite direction. So we say that a set X in uh, of the... Um, natural numbers is a Sidon set if um, the only solutions to x plus y equals z plus w with 
x, y, z and w in x are trivial ones. So ones where um, x and y is just some permutation of uh, z and w. So I'll write that in a slightly succinct way by saying that. So either x equals z and y equals w, or x equals w and y equals z. Um, so uh, then a natural question about Sidon sets is, uh, so sort of the opposite of the argument that I gave about a lower bound for the size of a basis gives an upper bound for um, the size of x intersect 1 to n because uh, the number of sums, let's say if that equals m, then uh, the number of sums that we can make out of uh, elements of x that are in 1 to m, is that 1 to n, is, um, if we're assuming that they're all different, is exactly m plus 1 choose 2. Um, but they all lie in the set 2 up to 2n. So in particular, we'll get that uh, that's less than or equal to 2n. So uh, we get roughly m less than or equal to 2 root n or something. So we know that uh, the function, if we define sort of fx of n to be this the size of this intersection, uh, then what I've just shown is that uh, fx grows at most as fast as root n up to a constant. And a nice, a very nice open problem is this sharp. Um, now, the argument I've just given here shows that uh, if you just want a, um, a finite example, so you just want the largest subset of the numbers from 1 to n as you can, um, we get this upper bound of uh, 2 root n. And um, there's a very nice construction of Erdős, which I think I will give, I'll put as an example sheet question with some hints, of course. Uh, so Erda showed that the answer is yes up to a constant. In fact, you can do we, we know a bit better than that. We know it up to we know even what the constant is, and it's down to the error term now. So yes for finite version of problem. It's actually not completely obvious, um, but it is the case that um, we can uh, find a set of size approximately square root n that does not, that such that each um, sum occurs at most once. Uh, but, so you might think, well, okay, if you do it for finite things, then you should just find an example for, let's say, each power of two, and then sort of put those examples together in a, in a clever way, and bingo, you've got a, an infinite example. But I recommend trying that, and you'll find, <laughs> you'll find that it doesn't actually, you'll have a lot of trouble doing it. Um, so let me just uh, quickly talk you through, actually no, I think I'll leave that as, as an exercise as well. What I'm going to just say is that if you use the greedy algorithm, so basically you just pick a set and each new element is the smallest element you can choose that uh, doesn't cause the condition that uh, you only have um, trivial solutions, so this doesn't cause that condition to be violated. Uh, then you get a set with growth rate. So I'm, I, this is what I mean by the growth rate, the number of elements in, um, up to n <coughs> as a function of n. The growth rate more like uh, the cube root of n. So that's quite a big gap. And I will mention uh, it's actually extremely hard to do any any better than um, than the cube root of n, but there is a, 
an unbelievable, uh, really one of the most beautiful papers I know in the whole of mathematics due to Imre Ruja, he got an example that gave uh, something like n to the root 2 minus 1, if I remember correctly. There may be log factors in there, I can't remember. Uh, but anyway, root 2 minus 1 is about 0.414, and so that's bigger than a third. But uh, we're still not up to uh, a half. And since Ruja's example, which came out about, uh, I suppose, about 25 to 30 years ago, um, I don't think there's been any really significant uh, progress on that particular problem. But it's a very, very nice question. Um, what was my next question going to be? Um, I think I'm going to, to move to a... So both those questions were concerning um, the size of a set uh, and how big it can be without containing either... Uh, yes, in the first, in the second case, without containing a non-trivial example of uh, this configuration or a solution to this equation. In the um, Erdős basis question, we assumed that we had a lot of solutions, well, I had a solution to x plus y equals n for each uh, n, but we were looking at sort of whether we can find solutions to x1 plus y1 equals x2 plus y2 equals up to equals xk plus yk. Um, so this shows you uh, one quite significant theme in combinatorial number theory, which is conditions on sets that will or will not guarantee that you can find solutions to certain sorts of equations. So uh, perhaps the most famous theorem that I think counts as a, a highlight of combinatorial number theory, but also in a sense a starting point for additive combinatorics, uh, and that's Semiradis' theorem, about which we'll hear quite a lot more in this course, although we'll fall, we'll, we won't go as far as um, a complete proof of the theorem, but we'll prove some important special cases and related results. Uh, and that says that for every delta greater than zero, and for every positive integer k, there exists an n such that uh, for every subset of 1 to n, um, of size at least delta n, it contains, every, every set of size at least delta n contains an arithmetic progression of length k. So this again, actually, an arithmetic progression of length k, we can think of as uh, a solution, actually this time to some simultaneous equations. So what is the condition for this to be an arithmetic progression? We need x3 minus x, or x2 minus x1. Ah. Let's get my eraser working. There we go. x2 minus x1 equals x3 minus x2 equals x4 minus x3 equals dot 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 equals xk minus xk minus 1. So what this says is simply that a, a set that's large enough must contain a solution to these simultaneous equations here. So, so far, everything that I've talked about um, has to do with finding solutions to equations in sets that have suitable properties. Sometimes they're density properties, sometimes they're an assumption that you've already got some solutions uh, to related equations. Um, so I don't want to try to explain at this moment uh, why Semiradis' theorem has the central position that it has in, in the subject, except to say, I suppose, that um, it's a much harder theorem than you might at first think. It has a sort of look as though it would either have a sort of reasonably easy proof or it would just be false. But actually it's uh, true with only pretty hard proofs. 
But what's interesting about it is it's now got quite a few quite difficult proofs, and each proof seems to have sort of led to the development of techniques that have had a lot of applications elsewhere as well. Um, and that's something that I want to talk about a little bit more in, in just a moment when I start trying to explain what the difference is between combinatorial number theory and additive combinatorics. But just before I do that, I want to mention one other really nice um, question. So I defined what a sum set was, and more generally, uh, actually, we'll, since we're going to be talking about these, I might as well say that we also, of course, we can define A plus B to be the set of X plus Y, such that X belongs to A and Y belongs to B. Uh, and in fact, we can talk about A minus B being the set of all X minus Y, such that X is in A and Y is in B. And we can talk about A times B, that's the set of X, Y, such that X is in A and Y is in B. And um, what can we say about, uh, if, if A has size N, let's make A a subset of uh, the natural numbers, let's say, and A has size N, what can we say about the size of A plus A? Well, we've already seen that uh, a plus A has size at most N plus 1 choose 2. But, uh, well, this will be an exercise to prove that it's got size at least 2N minus 1 with equality if and only if A is an arithmetic progression of length N. Um, it's not particularly hard to show this uh, and slightly trickier to show that the only extremal examples are arithmetic progressions of length n. But that will be an exercise on an example sheet, one that's quite nice to do. Um, so we think of the sum set as being small if it's kind of, uh, if its size is linear in n, and large if it's more like quadratic in n. Now, uh, the same bounds for essentially the same reasons, because you just take logs. Um, apply to the product set. So I can also uh, put A times A in there. So, so far so good. Uh, but if you then want to know about both the sum set and the product set, their sizes at the same time, suddenly you get one of the best known and most difficult seeming open problems um, in combinatorial number theory, which is now regarded as a problem in additive combinatorics. Um, so Edash and Semeredi uh, noticed that it doesn't seem to be very easy to find a set where both the sum set and the product set are small. In fact, it doesn't seem to be easy to find an example where they're not both, where, where not at least one of them uh, is extremely large. So if, you, if, for example, you take an arithmetic progression then it's not that hard to show that the product set must be very large, must be um, sort of n squared up to log factors. And the sets that make uh, the product set small are geometric progressions, and those um, have very large sum sets. So the question is, if epsilon is greater than 0 and n is large enough, must at least one of the uh, sum set and the product set be large, where large means size at least n to the 2 minus epsilon, so pretty close to the maximum possible. And uh, the best known bound is something, I can't remember it because it's n to the four thirds plus, uh, I'm going to, it's something like one over one, one, six, seven plus little o one. Um, and um, I'm just trying to remember who did that. It's in, I've got that in the notes. Um, I've, I, I'm afraid I've, temporarily forgotten their names. Um, but uh, for a long time, actually, the best bound known was um, 
and the four thirds, and that was due to Josef Shoimoshi. And um, then eventually that got uh, improved just a tiny bit, and that that sort of tiny bit has now been improved a tiny bit more a couple of times. So uh, we've got this just a little bit better than n to the four thirds, but that seems to be way short of what ought to be true. So that's another very nice problem. And I mentioned that problem because it's an example of a question where it's not really about finding um, a configuration in a set if the set has suitable properties. It's about sizes of some sets and product sets, uh, which is a somewhat different um, idea. So now uh, the time has come to try to say what additive combinatorics is. And um, I think what I'd like to say is that it that the subject matter is somewhat similar. It starts off being somewhat similar to that of combinatorial number theory. It looks at uh, subsets of uh, sets of numbers and that kind of thing. But then in one sense, it becomes more general. So the subject matter expands and we look at uh, things like subsets of, so this is, and now I'm talking about additive combinatorics now. Uh, so we look not just at subsets of um, integers, but we also look at subsets of abelian groups, uh, or even just not necessarily abelian groups. Um, and it turns out that, so again, these questions are interesting because you start with something with a lot of algebraic structure, namely a group or an abelian group, um, but you then make it into a combinatorial type of uh, consideration by uh, looking at arbitrary subsets of them. And um, that has turned out in quite surprising ways to uh, have sort of, first of all, not so surprisingly, it helps to use some techniques from group theory to answer questions about subsets of abelian groups or subsets of groups, particularly groups actually, um, because abelian groups are somewhat more, somewhat simpler objects. Um, but maybe a little bit more surprisingly, the uh, some of the results of additive combinatorics have actually turned out to be useful in group theory, even though group theorists tend to look at much more um, algebraic objects. So sometimes, for example, um, you might have a question about, let's say, a sum of conjugacy classes in a group. And because so a, a product, I mean, of, of conjugacy classes in a group, and because you don't always um, expect a product of conjugacy classes to be particularly, uh, you know, conjugacy classes aren't closed under multiplication, so we, somehow we don't expect the product of, of two conjugacy classes to be a particularly uh, sort of structured thing to, to think about. And it sometimes it turns out that just thinking of a conjugacy class as being an arbitrary subset for some purposes uh, is a sensible thing to do and um, using techniques from additive combinatorics, there are useful things that one can say. Uh, that's just a little bit vague, but th there are some quite serious uh, connections. Also the topic of growth in groups is closely related to the sort of size of product sets in groups. Um, and uh, that turns out to be a very fruitful connection. So, um, the subject matter is a bit more general, but I think rather more important than that is that the techniques have become much more general. So by and large, and this is an oversimplification, but by and large, the techniques used to prove results in combinatorial number theory up to, uh, um, I don't know, sort of late 80s or something like that, tended to be... Um, elementary. So that's elementary in the technical sense of proofs that you could sort of understand from first principles and didn't have to learn any kind of techniques first. But, uh, well, actually, you know, some of these developments took place um, before the late 80s, because uh, one of the most important ones was um, that Hillel Furstenberg came up with a proof of Semmerades theorem in 1977, um, which uh, used ergodic theory or dynamical systems. So Furstenberg proved something called the Furstenberg correspondence principle 
that showed that Samaradi's theorem was equivalent to a certain statement about dynamical systems, and then he proved that statement about dynamical systems. And that was extremely influential and led to a lot of other proofs of combinatorial results using methods from dynamical systems. Um, the case of, for progressions of length 3 of Samaradi's theorem was actually proved by Roth um, in the early 50s uh, using harmonic analysis, so that's another technique. So, but that was a bit of a kind of um, one-off, but has become very much not a... a actually, well, there have been other arguments using harmonic analysis, combinatorial arguments, but harmonic analysis is now a really big... Well, it's, it's one of the central techniques, and we'll see, we'll have it in, in this course, uh, particularly discrete um, Fourier analysis. It's one of the central te techniques of additive combinatorics, so you, you couldn't really be a, a serious additive combinatorialist without knowing discrete Fourier analysis. Um, but you could have been a, a, a serious combinatorial number theorist without knowing any discrete Fourier analysis. Um, and uh, what else have we got? Well, a lot of connections between additive combinatorics and analytic number theory. And there are a lot of connections with extremal combinatorics. Those are all two-way connections. So it, harmonic analysis feeds into um, additive combinatorics and additive combinatorics feeds back. Same with analytic number theory, same with extremal combinatorics. Uh, probability to some extent. I mean, we additive combinatorialists are happy to use probabilistic methods. Theoretical computer science is a slightly unexpected one. Uh, I can't offhand think of um, an application of theoretical computer science to additive combinatorics. But there are certainly problems in theoretical computer science that raise additive combinatorial type questions. And so there's been a lot of interest in theoretical computer science in questions in additive combinatorics. And some theoretical computer scientists have solved problems in additive combinatorics, not so much using theoretical computer science methods, but um, inspired by problems in theoretical computer science. And I had one other example. Oh, yes, another very surprising uh, area that turn, has now got a rather fruitful interface with additive combinatorics is model theory. Um, and my colleague Julia Wolf knows a lot about that and has worked in on that in that interface. So I think one of the things that really makes for me additive combinatorics a rather exciting area is that it just has these it spreads its tentacles around and it uh, has these links to all these other areas of mathematics. I'm not going to talk about very much of that. I will talk quite a bit about, I won't talk at all about ergodic theory, I'll talk quite a bit about harmonic analysis and extremal combinatorics and not much about the others. Um, but uh, I just want to let you know that these other connections exist. And I think that also gives additive combinatorics a somewhat uh, special flavour within the broad um, area of combinatorics, which so if you were to ask me, is additive combinatorics a sub-branch of combinatorics? I'd say sort of, yes, in a way, but it's perhaps more like a kind of its own area that overlaps substantially with combinatorics, but also mixes up with, with, with these other areas. So I think that's all I'm going to say. One thing I didn't say, actually, about uh, the way I like to, to run these uh, videos is that I don't want to give full lectures in each um, video because I think watching an hour long video is a bit much to expect. Actually this one's already been a bit longer than I intended. I'm going to try to break the course up into smaller chunks than that and um, so most of them I will aim to be more like sort of half hour videos uh, and I'll try to have um, make it sort of clear where we are in the course and I also won't feel obliged to make the videos end at exactly the right moment. So in other words, if, I, if I've got a 50 minute lecture to do, I won't uh, make sure that every 50 minutes I reach the end of the lecture. So it won't always be sort of 30 plus 20 or something. It might be 30 plus 30, but then I will make it clear that uh, that, that second 30 has uh, gone 10 minutes into the next lecture. Um, and I have a sort of numbering system 
that will make that clear and perhaps I'll talk about that a bit more next time. But for now I think I will stop and uh, the next lecture I will start doing some serious maths. Thank you very much and here we go.